Greetings from Hunter College. My name is Saborno Isaac Berry, and today we're going to be doing the Bolzano virus frost theorem as well as the Cauchy criterion. So let's start with the Bolzano virus frost theorem. You might remember this from last time, but we actually didn't get to cover it in detail and prove it. So let's rehash it. The Bolzano virus frost theorem is essentially just every bounded sequence. has, or rather contains, a convergent subsequence. So, let's look at how we might go about this. Bounded just means there's a lower bound less than every element, and an upper bound greater than every element. So we just have A and B to represent those, and our sequence is just A sub N. And our subsequence is going to be a sub n sub k. So then, here's what we're going to do. First, bisect it. Take the average of these two. And now, here's the thing. This is going to be a proof for infinite subsequences and sequences in general. Finite sequences will be covered next time. And by infinite sequences, I don't mean sequences that go on forever, or uh, sequence. <coughs> and by finite sequences, I don't mean sequences that just stop. I mean sequences that go through the same set of values over and over. So, like for example, the sequence which is the digits of pi: three, one, four, one, five, nine, two, six, five, three, five, eight, nine, seven. I don't actually remember where zero is, but it's just got to be somewhere in here. And so the range of this whole sequence does 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. with all the base 10 digits. This is finite, even though pi is obviously an infinite sequence of digits. So that's what we mean when we say infinite range. So we'll say that this is I1, and that might look a little, a little familiar to you. Why? Because it is. It's from the nested interval property. Essentially saying that the intersection of infinite sequences that are all nested inside each other is never equal to the empty set, as long as I1 is a superset of I2, which is a superset of I3, which is a superset of I4, so on and so forth. So we can actually prove that if these are proper subsets, that means I3 and never equal to I4, I2 and never equal to I3, I1 and never equal to I2, and so on and so forth, and they're all going to be proper subsets in our example then we can say that there's exactly one element in their intersection, but we're not going to prove that today. Instead, all we have to say is that x exists and is in this intersection. That's all we need the nested interval property for. So x is going to be the limit of our sequence. And then we're going to prove it using the whole a n minus x is less than epsilon thing. So now, the thing is, so given that this is an infinite sequence, has to be for it to converge to some point, that means that either it can't be finite on both sides of the uh, center, so it's either finite on this side and infinite on this side, or it's infinite on this side and finite on this side. We don't really need to consider the both sides are infinite case, and we'll see why in a second. Well, all we want to do is just, we have A1 somewhere in here, and we have A N1, the first element of our subsequence, and it doesn't really matter where we put it. So then, we have A2, but where do we find that? Well, whichever half has more elements, this half or this half. 
So if this half has finitely many elements, we go for the infinite half. Because since there are infinitely many elements in here, at some point, there must exist at least one, well, infinitely many, which are greater than or equal to, well, just greater than, n1. And that k is going to be our n2. So we're going to find it somewhere over here. And of course, in the scenario that both are infinite, it doesn't even matter which one you pick. So you can pick either this side or this side. It doesn't really matter. Now, where do we find A3? Very simple. All we have to do is bisect the half that we're already on. So we have, I think it's going to be the average of these two. So it's just going to be a plus b over 2 plus b over 2. Or if we want to actually simplify it and not look like a psycho, a plus 3b over 4. So then, what do we do now? Well, we see which half has an infinite amount. Why do we not go to this half? Because it already has finitely many. There's no chance for either of these halves to be infinitely many and then present the next choice for us. So essentially, what we have is like a branching tree diagram. We have the two at the start, and we choose whichever one is infinite. Then we have the two after that, and we choose whichever one is infinite. Then we have the two after that, and we choose whichever one is infinite. Then we have the two even after that, and we choose the one which is infinite. Then we choose the two after that, and we choose the one which is infinite, and so on and so forth. And so, at some point, this will lead us to x. So, let's say this side has infinitely many. So then, all we have to do is just find 1, which is greater than n2, which must be possible because there are infinitely many. So there's a n3. Now we bisect the half we're already on again. So I think this time, just take it with a grain of salt, we have a plus 7b over 8. So then all we have to do is figure out where the next one is. Is it in this half or this half, which is infinite? And so on and so forth. So i1 is just a to b. I2 is going to be a plus b over 2 to b. I3 is going to be uh, a plus 3b over 4 to b. I4 is going to be a plus 7b over 8 to b, and so on and so forth. We keep bisecting these and choosing whichever one has infinitely many terms. So the nested intervals eventually have to lead to one number at the end. Now, here's the very key part. Okay, so the length of each of these intervals, the length of the first interval is just 2 times b minus a. No, just b minus a, actually. The length of the second interval is b minus a over 2. The length of the third one is b minus a over 4, so on and so forth. So we can say in total it's just b minus a over 2 to the n. And this, as we know from last time, approaches zero. Didn't we show that this approaches zero when our base is between zero and one, which it is over here because it's just one half? So this approaches zero. Now what does that mean? Well, much like the harmonic sequence, we can say that if, if we have some epsilon neighborhood, small as we can imagine, so the length of that epsilon neighborhood is two epsilon, and it's going to be center around x, because that's our limit. And so this is x minus epsilon. And this is x plus epsilon. So our interval has to contain x. So that means it must be at least, uh, has to be about the size of epsilon. So we can always find 
something that is as small as we want. Why? Because this is pretty much dense around a zero. We can always find something that is smaller than epsilon or two epsilon or whatever we have. So there must exist n such that for all n is greater than or equal to n, so given epsilon is greater than zero, b minus a over two to the n is less than epsilon or two epsilon if you really desire it. So then, we can show that this interval may very well lie inside our neighborhood. So, since it lies inside our neighborhood, this interval also must contain an element of our subsequence, as we've seen over here. Otherwise, there's no point in creating these intervals. We're creating them specifically to find viable spots for our subsequence elements. So let's say this is I n, interval n. So then we have some element in here, a n n. Or I'm going to use k because we've already used capital N in here. So we have interval k, we have a n k, which is inside this epsilon neighborhood. Doesn't that satisfy? the requirement, and we can do this given any epsilon because we can always find an interval of smaller length. So that is essentially how we prove that this thing converges in the first place.